majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them, yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Church on the Boulevard. Uh, I can't believe it's the last day of January already. It seems the older I get, the faster the months and the years go, but I hope you've been having a good week. I'm hoping that you can see God working in your life because I know he is there for us and he is always working behind the, behind the scenes. Let's have a word of prayer before we continue. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Just thank you for the freedom that we still have to come worship you and to, to praise you in, in, in open and to talk to others about you and, and let them know how much you love them. Father, thank you for this sanctuary. Thank you for the, the group gathered here and for the people that are watching online. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, help us to hear your voice, help us to know your will for our lives and give us the strength and the desire to, to follow you no, no matter where it may lead. We pray that you would bless the message being brought today. We love you so much, God, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Come, let us bow down in worship of our God. Come, let us live for the maker of our hearts. Praise his awesomeness and his majesty. Praise for endless days. Jesus, our God, reigns. Yeah. 
Good morning. This is the fifth Sunday. Everybody knows this is Roger's favorite time of year, the fifth Sunday, where now I get to be Roger and walk around like a game show host, and we get to talk about the things in our life that we're proud of, that we want to praise God for. We have a prayer request. Just give everybody in the congregation a chance to speak and just say what they're grateful for, what they need prayer for. You just hold up your hand, and I come around like the price is right. That's what we're going to do right now. One winner right here. There's uh, so many people in the hospital, so many people on their way to heaven, so many people gone to heaven. Uh, Miss Priscilla, her mom has gone to heaven. We need to hold her up. Donzo, he's still hanging in there. And... Uh, Diane and I have been over there taking care of his house, and it hurts because he's such a blessing because he just came to our church, and God's decided something else for him. Uh, my mom and I went to her doctor's appointment, and uh, we're working on our relationship still. It's trying, but with God's help, I will bite my tongue more and give him thanks. Um, oh my goodness, Miss Linda, Miss Dorothy, uh, Nan, everybody here. Um, I have had so much frustration the last several weeks, months, and um, it just gets away from you sometimes. And I was I was ready just to head back to California. I was just so frustrated. I couldn't deal with it. And I get, sit down on my knees and I ask God and bite, you know, bite my tongue again and just try to listen what he's saying. And I have to say, I love you guys as much as my family in California. My sister and my brother and my nieces and everything, they want their grandma home. They want to do more, but they have their hands full. So I need to pray for them. And I need to pray for me and my mom that uh, we can hold on strong and do whatever it is God wants us to do. And I just want you to know, thank you. First, I want to give honor to God. Um. We just buried my son's father Friday. And I want to tell everybody, if you have someone you care deeply for, let them know. Show them why they're here. Why they can hear it and feel it. Don't wait the last minute. I'm going to ask you all to keep me and my family in your prayers. This last month and a half, we had five. I know five people that passed away. And it's one thing he coming to my mind. I read a verse the other day, and it said, hear God's word. Learn God's, hear God's word, learn God's word, and live God's word. And it's very important at this time that we do that. Because life is too short not to. God is coming back. Jesus is coming back sooner than we think. And it's time for us to get our lives in order before it's too late. So you have someone in your life that you love. Don't let the fear stop you from letting them know. Show love while you have a chance. Like I said, keep me and my family here in your prayers. My sister, she's sick now again. But I know with God's help, we will pull through this. Because that's all I have left. Anybody else want to speak? Head over here in the corner.
Dorothy has some serious problems health-wise. Don't know whether it's heart's long, but uh, the doctors are trying to figure it all out. Ask you to pray that you can, for her to, her doctors to figure out what is bothering her and what's taking her down. Thank you. I want to give everybody an update on Terry Walker. Um, I know a lot of you have asked us, you know, about them. Uh, he was doing better for a while. Um, recently, he's taken a ba ba bad turn, so thank you for praying for him. And I would encourage anybody who can to reach out and just give them a word of encouragement. Um, and... Um, I also want to thank everybody that's been supportive of my medical issues lately. Um, you all know what they are. But it's going to be a constant battle probably throughout my life. Thank you. I just want to praise God for who he is. I am so thankful for the blessings <clears throat> that he gives each and every one of us and that he's here with us every single day. He's in our hearts and he's guiding our path. And I just want to praise him for that. And speaking on what Shai said, I've been working with my brother, rebuilding a relationship with him. And he called me yesterday and he needs a ride from the hospital, which is amazing because he's had a lot of medical problems, but he will never call and tell anyone. But we're going to be picking him up tomorrow from the hospital and taking him home. And it's just thankful for this chance to witness God to him and hopefully to bring his message. I want to praise God that we have a church here where we can hear God's word. And one of my favorite verses is James 4, 7. Therefore, to God, wait a minute, I forget. James 4, 7, submit to God, therefore, and reset the devil, and he will flee from you. I know the devil like to attack you, to keep you away from church, keep you away from God. Think of that verse and read it over and over and over to reset the devil. Say, no, devil, I'm going to church. I'm going to hear God's word. And the devil like to attack you. So I just, just pray for all these people who... The devil has been attacking people from keeping them from going to church to hear God's word. Keep in mind, just say no to devil. I belong to Jesus. I mean, I belong to, to church. I go to church to hear God's word. Anybody else? Um, all of you know my mother. She loves everybody. She prays for everybody. Um, sometimes she writes poems for her people or whole congregations. Um, so I'm asking that you all lift my mother up in prayer. Um, she has had a really rough past year, and it has really taken its toll on her. Um, not just physically, but emotionally. And this is a woman who has, she's been with her husband since she was 14, and she's now 82. So she is one of the strongest faith-living women I've known in my life. But you know, sometimes life can get really, really hard, and it can, it can test that faith. So please lift my mama up in your prayers this week. Her strength, um, not just physically, but emotionally. And just prayers that Jesus is always her constant. That's what she taught us. 
no matter what. Jesus is your constant. Thank you. Well, if nobody else is raising their hand, we're going to go and have a prayer to God and lift everybody's prayers and request up to God and we'll move forward. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this great opportunity to enter your house and to worship and to just come and be filled with believers and the human connection that we need, Lord. And everybody, because we're human, we have struggles, we have heartaches, we have sorrows, and we also have joy. And that's why we come to the house of the Lord, to bring all of those things to you, Lord, our sorrows, our pain, just everything that we have, Lord, and say, I'm here. This is what I have, and please help me through the things that we need to do. And I lift up all these people in the church and everything that they're going through, their struggles, their hard times, their hard, just as we go through these things, Lord, that we can look to you and say, you are our strength, you are our salvation, and we have hope. And because we have you, we have that. And Lord, I know sometimes it's very hard for us to look to you, but it is the only thing that we have in this world that will never, ever, ever leave us. And I thank you for those things. In your name, amen. 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 I know we've, we've had a lot of hard times over the past, this past year. Everybody has, has had a hard time. And even now, if, if, you're, if you're having, you know, being blessed, you're seeing God, you know, working in your life in a good way, or if you are struggling and you are clinging on to him with everything you have, I encourage you to remember that God is good. Amen? Amen. Let's sing about that. No height or depth can separate Your steadfast love we can't escape Your faithfulness and grace and mercy we sing God is so good God is so good God is so good He's so good to me
name. You're so good to me. God, you are so good to us. We love you more than anything else. You alone are our heart's desire. You alone are our strength and our shield. And we long to worship you.
I've skipped the video the last couple of weeks for a variety of reasons. One, I didn't really think we needed them. And it was interesting. I told Isaac, I said, Isaac, just pick one. I don't care which one it is. And that one was perfect for today and what I want to say about uh, Lottie Moon. First and foremost, this is the last Sunday that we are officially collecting. Trust me, you give us Lobby Moon money anytime, we'll get it to them. Um, second, we had a goal, 1600 Well, we have 1672 and some change. Yay! So that means you guys can get rid of your envelopes today. We don't, we're not going to, don't, no, no, no. What that means is now you reach into your heart and you go, okay, what can I give them? Because here's what I know. There are 3,800 missionaries that we're supporting. Now, hold on. That's a biblical 3,800. Here's what I mean by that. Remember when Jesus fed 5,000? They were only counting the men. That was a family. I don't even know how many was in that family. Four at least. You don't think those kids are missionaries? I think so. How about that 10 to 20 college kids that go every year? The SBC is not supporting them. They're like our missionaries when we go away. They're paying their way. But trust me, the missionaries are supporting them. Every time we've gone on a mission trip, we go someplace and we pay to go there. But wherever we go supplies us stuff. They help take care of us. So I wanted this to start off early instead of later in the announcements because I want to give you a chance to think about it. We have made our goal. If you don't give another penny, we can hang our heads high and say we met our goal. But what a low mark to set, right? So think about that. Man, give. We can't give enough. More reality, we can't give enough of ourselves because God asks us to give more. Because there's a wide mission field out there. As you saw in that video, they talked about all the programs that they did. They talked about all the, the, the programs and processes and, and wonderful things that they did. Right? I mean, they had to have, uh, wait. I didn't hear a single program that they were running. I didn't hear a single process. I didn't hear a single, hey, we're going to, you know, open up this. What I heard was names. Names of people. Hey, I got to help this person, and we're praying for this person. And this person's, they're struggling. I mean, we're talking Italy. So when they talk about struggling with their policies and stuff like that, I can almost guarantee you they're, they're struggling with their Roman Catholic roots. I got no problem with Roman Catholics. But it's kind of hard for them to give us some of that up when we tell them, hey, Jesus said you don't need all that. Or I'm talking about somebody that's got cancer and praying for a wife who lost her husband, walking alongside somebody. Guys, man, that's a beautiful example for us because that's what we do. That's what we should be doing, right? Oh, sorry, I know I'm not preaching. But, you know, I, hey, I haven't preached in two months, so I'm getting a little itchy. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming back. <laughs> but all of that is to say, guys, we need to reach out more. And so that leads right into our announcements. We have food bank on Monday. It's a morning food bank. If you can be here to help them unload and, and set up, 8.30, right? If you can be, can't be here at 8.30, because maybe you can be here at 9, show up at 9. Not because it's the food bank, but because it's your chance to go, oh, I remember you. Like, can I pray for you? What can I do for you? Wednesday night, we've got the grab-and-go dinner. Again, it's a chance. Some people are hanging out because they miss people. We got people that'll come. Got people that'll come at five thirty and stay. Oh, is it time for us to close? Do we have to leave now? Well, you can stay another twenty minutes because it's going to take us that long to clean up. 
It's not about the dinner. Yeah, we're meeting their physical needs. We also need to meet their emotional and spiritual needs. Wednesday night, Michelle, kitchen crew, they can use you. Um, ladies' tea next Sunday. It says bring your favorite potato toppings. I'm assuming you're having baked potatoes of some sort with lots of good toppings. I say it that way, but I'm, I'm kind of jealous because it sounds really good. I love baked potatoes. Um, also bring a side dish or a dessert. Kids' Valentine's party on the 14th. Um, couples, the 20th, 6 to 8. It's going to be our uh, rustic uh, picnic love fest, if you will. Uh, keep the price the same as last year, 30 bucks, if I remember right, for the couples. And that'll get you, you know, dinner and dessert and entertainment and me yapping at you like usual. <laughs> and again, you don't have to be married. You can be dating. That's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll prep you for the marriage stage. Um, or scare you away from it after you watch enough of us. And then the card ministry is on the 26th. Um, but people, brothers and sisters, reach out to people. This is a struggling time. It's a struggling time. Don't be afraid to do the little things. Don and I were in a restaurant the other day and. uh, we were praying over our meal, and our waitress, um, who had a boot on her foot, goes, oh, I'm so sorry for interrupting your prayer. And of course, my response is, it's okay, you're not interrupting our prayer. It's, you know, trust me, we'll pray around you. <laughs> and she goes, no, 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 no. She goes, can I ask you something? And I'm like, I just want to eat. I haven't eaten since noon, and it's like 8 o'clock. <laughs> but yeah, I'll ask away. See, that's, 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 that's me getting in the way, right? So well, Dawn kicks me under the table. I'm kidding. She didn't. She probably should have. But I didn't say anything. I just looked at her and said, sure. She goes, I've had this problem with my foot for like ever. And the doctors aren't sure what to do with it. And the doctors, you know, they, you know, bone something. They may have to remove part of it. And this is the last thing they can try before they have to, you know, take it off. And I'm like, oh, Okay. <laughs> You just pray that the doctors know what to do. And I'm like, that we can do. I said, I'll do you one better. I said, I'll bring it to my church family. My church family will pray for you. Her name is Michelle. That is what we do. That's what those missionaries do that we're supporting. That's what we do around here. Not about big fancy programs. It's about loving Christ and through Christ loving others. And I've messed with the ushers long enough because they don't have a clue that I'm about to ask them to come down. So this is my prep for them. <laughs> but guys, that's what we do. I know that's longer than the announcements were supposed to be, but you know what we do. What's in the announcements is so that we can serve others, right? Ladies' tea. That's important. That's a fellowship. That's where you guys pick each other up and figure out, you know, how you can meet others' needs. Cards ministry, and you're blessing people. One card, ten cards, a hundred cards. Couples dinner, as strange as that sounds, I'm doing what we can to bless couples. And we actually have quite a few people that come from outside the church that don't attend church that just come to the couple's dinner that know us, somebody in their lives. Jesus says, love your neighbor. Everybody's my neighbor. Yes, we got to love them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to, to love others. Man, we are human and selfish, and we wouldn't want to do that, but you've loved us, and so you push us to love others. Lord, bless our offering that we're about to give both to the church and to Lottie Moon. It sounds like money, but Lord, it's not. It's love. It's love because it gives us a chance to to meet together and to help other people. So bless that offering. May we use it wisely. Bless those that are struggling. Give them peace. Let them find joy in their struggle. Because, Lord, it's there. In the struggle, there is joy. 
says, joy is not an emotion. Joy is found in you, which means let us know you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> God always seems to give us what we need. I mean, exactly when we need it. Been struggling for a little bit and had an opportunity to go away this last week for a couple of nights with my wife, and I needed that. We spent it with some friends, and I needed that. We came home yesterday and came to the church, and I saw a multitude of people working and cleaning and fixing things, and that just blessed my heart. I needed that. And I had the opportunity to 
attend a recovery meeting, and I needed that. I'm just so grateful that God gives us what we need when we need it. But you know, he does that for a purpose. The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about being grown up. Grown up as Christians. We talked about being perfect like our Father is perfect and understanding that that word in the Greek doesn't mean without sin, but it means to be mature. To be mature like our Father in heaven is mature. And we talked about being holy priests, a royal priesthood, being mature servants. So I know God gives us what we need when we need it because he wants us to be right where we need to be and equipped with what we need to fulfill his purpose and his pleasure. Well, we're going to continue talking about being grown up this morning. And we're going to talk a little bit, uh, and, and I, I liked what Shai said about, uh, you know, teaching. I liked what Jerry said, you know, about uh, uh, not just the missionaries or the people that share the gospel, but so do their families, so do their children. And we're going to talk about speaking and teaching like an adult. So if you have your Bibles, would you find the book of Hebrews? Hebrews. Find Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 7 through 14. Hebrews 5, 7 through 14. I'll be reading from the New International Version translation. Whatever scripture I use this morning, that's the translation I'm using. Here we go, starting with verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, you probably don't know who Melchizedek is, but he was a king. He was the king of Salem, but he was also a priest, about the first one mentioned in the Bible. And actually, he was the king and the priest of what actually became Jerusalem. So you could say he was the first priest of Jerusalem. Verse 11. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, the teleos, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Hebrews says that by this time, you and I, anybody who professes Jesus as their Savior and Lord, we should be teachers. Why? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But first, find a few people to greet and tell them that we're going to be learning to speak and teach like an adult. Go ahead.
So this morning we're going to be talking about being perfect like our Father is perfect, mature like our Father. We're going to be talking about a royal priesthood, being mature servants. So we're going to continue along that line, but we're also going to be talking about being mature at sharing the gospel, at speaking and teaching. Would you bow your heads and let me pray? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the folks at home that are watching. Father, whether we're at home or whether we're in your house, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would move within us to help us understand what you have for us, to help us understand this portion of Scripture and more that you want us to grow up into, to be mature at. Lord, we know some things now. We know that, that you are teaching us to be more like you, that you are teaching us to be more like our Savior. Now, Lord, help us to understand what it is, how it is, who it is, when it is, that you want us to share our relationship with those around us. Father, we ask that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. There was this guy who was scheduled to speak at this business dinner, this important business dinner. And so he's sitting there, and he's eating the meal before he speaks. But he must have bitten down on something hard because right at that moment, his false teeth, his dentures broke in his mouth. Now, nearly paralyzed by panic, he, he, he mutters to the guy sitting next to him. He says, I can't believe it. He says, my false teeth just broke, and I got to get up in just a minute and speak. And the guy that, that he said that to says, no problem. I've got an extra pair of dentures you can use. And then the guy pulls out a few sets of false teeth from his pocket, and, 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 he, and he presents him to this, this frantic man that's about to speak. And this, 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 this guy says, hey, you know, well, well, let me try him. And he, he takes the first pair, and he, and he puts them in, and they're too tight. And he takes the second pair, and he puts them in, and they're too loose. No, this is not Goldilocks and the three teeth. But the third pair he puts in, and they fit like a dream. And now, totally relieved, he sits back, and he, and he enjoys finishing his meal. And then afterward, he delivers this excellent speech at this business dinner. And at the end of the evening, uh, the speaker, he walks up to the guy who gave him the teeth, you know, his benefactor, and, and he thanks him for his help, and he says to him, he says, you know what, you really did me such a great favor tonight. I have been looking so hard for a good dentist. Where are you located? And the other guy looks at him and he says, I'm not a dentist, I'm an undertaker. <laughs> there are people who find it uncomfortable to talk to anybody about anything. And it wouldn't matter if they had their own teeth or they were wearing somebody else's. I mean, they would feel ill at ease teaching anybody anything about the Bible or God or Jesus or just about anything spiritual. And actually, that attitude is not abnormal. If you recall, when God called Moses into the desert, or he called him in the desert, he appeared to him in the form of a burning bush. You remember that? And there, God commanded Moses to return to Egypt, to confront Pharaoh, to speak to Pharaoh, to tell him, let my people go. And how did Moses respond? Well, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses says to the Lord, you know, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. In other words, the translation for what Moses was saying was, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Send somebody else. And then it's interesting how God responds to Moses. Look at Exodus 4.11. God says, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, God's translation of that was, don't give me your excuses. I want you to do this 
And if I'm asking you to do something, I will supply you with the ability and the resources. Over the past two weeks, we've talked about what God desires of us. First, we learn that God wants us to grow up to be like him. He wants us to mature to the point that when people see us, they see God's love. When people see us, they see God's mercy. When people see us, they see God's holiness. And most of all, when people see us being servants to others and to each other, they see God. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Second, we learn that not only are we to be mature in our faith, but that we are all priests. Every single one of us are priests. And that as priests and mature servants, we need to grow up in our servanthood to God. In other words, if there's a job that we see needs to be done in the church, we need to do it. We don't need to be asked. We don't need to be told. We just need to do it because that's what grown-ups do. No priest of God ever sat down to worship. They were always working for God. As 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 tells us, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, that's you and I, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully, not part-time, always not once in a while, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Hmm. Now, we talked about maturity, about being grown up. We talked about being like our father. We talked about being mature in the faith. We talked about being priests. We talked about being mature servants. But here in Hebrews chapter 5, it takes it a step further. In Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to take it a step further. I mean, we find that, that that part of maturity, part of growing up as children of God, is getting to the point in our faith where we seek, where we look for, where we anticipate opportunities to teach others. Let me read again verses 11 through 14 in Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. We have much to say about this. But it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need somebody to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant, that's a baby, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, the teleos, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now Paul writes that this should even be part of our worship experience. Paul writes in Colossians 3.16 that we should let the message of Christ dwell in us richly as we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. In other words, teaching each other and admonishing each other and singing to each other is part of what we should be doing in fellowship, for fellowship, teaching has always been a major part of the responsibility of every one of God's people. David taught in his psalm, Psalm 34, 11, he says, Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The law of Moses commands parents to teach their children. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them. In other words, teach them to your children. Talk, teach about them. When you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Paul advises Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach 
others. Titus. Titus was instructed also. In Titus 2, verse 3 and 4, he was, he was to, instructed, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in their way, in the way they live. Not to be slanderers or to, addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good so that they can urge, so that they can teach the younger women to love their husbands and children. I know. Some of you might say, you know, some of you may be thinking, but you know what? I don't have the gift of teaching. I don't have the gift. And I know you're thinking about that passage out of Romans 12. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, that says, we, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So some of you might say, well, I don't have the gift of teaching, so I don't have to teach. But let me tell you, that's a, there's a fatal flaw to that argument. If I were to argue that I can't teach because I don't have the gift of teaching, then I could argue the same thing about serving, the gift of serving, you know, so I don't have to serve others, or if I don't have the gift of giving, you know, I don't have to give, or if I don't have the gift of mercy, I don't have to be merciful. And of course, we all know that that's silly. It's silly. What God is telling us in Romans chapter 12 is that while everybody in the church should be doing things like showing mercy and helping others out and giving and so on, some people have a special gift for those things. Those who are so gifted should use their gift humbly. It should stand out for God's kingdom. And while some people are gifted teachers, and we have many in this church, God still expects every one of us to grow to the point where we seek to teach others, where we seek to share the gospel, where we seek to share our experiences and our relationship with God with others. It's part of being an adult Christian. Now, some people draw back from desiring to become teachers because they believe that teaching needs to be done in some kind of formal setting, you know, like a classroom or a Bible study or in front of a crowd or something like that. But as far as we know, the early church didn't have Sunday schools. They didn't have children's church. They didn't have youth groups. They didn't have, you know, small group Bible studies and so on. In fact, they had no church buildings. They met in homes and, 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 and wherever they could find on the streets, anywhere. And wherever they met, they worshiped God and they taught others. Anybody that was there, they taught them about their faith. And if you remember the passage from Deuteronomy that, 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 that I just read a little while ago, that's how teaching has always been. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 and 7 again says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. The commandments that I give you from this point on are to be on your hearts. Not once in a while, they're to be on your hearts. Your heart doesn't stop beating. It doesn't beat just once in a while. Your heart is there beating all the time. And these commandments are to be on your hearts all the time. So impress them on your children. Teach them. Talk about them. Teach them. When you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up, that's just about all the time. I remember reading this book. It's entitled Together at Home, written by a couple named Dean and Grace Merrill, but I remember reading this story that they, they talked about in there about their family, and they, 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 they told about this night that they took their kids to a pizza parlor, and, 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 and they said that, that they decided to use the minutes that they were waiting for their food as a teaching moment. They said, 
the parents gave the kids index cards, you know, three by five cards and a pencil. And they had them write down a memory verse that the parents had come up with. It was Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as, as if you were working for the Lord, not for people, not for human beings. And so they had them write that, that, that verse down on their three by five cards. And then they said to them, let's watch the waitress and see what kind of worker she is. See if you think that she is working with all of her heart. And so the kids never took their eyes off the waitress. I mean, they half, their half-whispered comments continued in, in a steady stream, you know. Uh, she sure is nice about bringing extra napkins. She, sure, she has to stand up all the time, and she's not even crabby. And the waitress never knew that she was being scrutinized. But, but by the end of the meal, the kids not only had that scripture verse, Colossians 3.23, nailed down and remembered, but they also had done an on-site study of its meaning. So you see, teaching doesn't have to be in a formal setting. You don't need a blackboard and a podium to teach. So why is it so important to God all of us, all of us get involved in teaching. Well, there are three reasons. One, if we don't make teaching others a priority in our lives, then heresy, false teaching, is just waiting to slip in. If we don't tell the truth, then lies Replace them. Teresa Kerrigan wrote about a children's Sunday school class that she took part in once. And, and she said that she had given a, a homework assignment to her Sunday school class to read Isaiah chapter 9. And then the next week, you know, as the kids come in, she, she asked them how many of them had remembered to read the chapter. Well, you know, all of them raised their hands and, and said that they read it. And she said, well, that's just wonderful. We're going to have just a great discussion. So let me start. Do you remember what the second verse in Isaiah chapter 9 said? And there was silence. And soon some of the kids started <laughs> you know, flipping through, trying to find Isaiah chapter 9. And she said, let me give you a bit of help. The people who walked in darkness, still no answer. And then she says, okay, I have a candy bar for the first one who can complete that verse, the people who walked in darkness. And all of a sudden, there's answers like, uh, the people who walked in darkness used less electricity. Uh, the people who walked in darkness stubbed their toes. The people who walked in darkness spend most of their time sleeping. The people who walked in darkness are usually burglars. The people who walked in darkness could really use a flashlight. And about that time, somebody finally found Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 in their book, and, 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 and they read it. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Now, granted, this was a class of kids who didn't know any better. But what I want you to notice is since they didn't know the Scripture very well, they simply interjected whatever seemed reasonable to them at the time. People in darkness, it seems reasonable that they use less electricity, that they might stub their toe, that, 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 that maybe they're a burglar, or maybe they, should, they could use a flashlight. I mean, those are reasonable things. But the point is, adults do that too. When adults are unfamiliar with God's word, and lack the desire to know God's word well enough to teach it to others, many adults that call themselves Christians substitute their opinions, defying scripture, substitute their opinions because they believe it's reasonable. Sometimes they even substitute their opinion for scripture because they, they think their approach is more reasonable. 
without the constant stress on the Bible and what the Bible teaches us, people can easily slip into heresy, false teaching. As Ephesians chapter 4 tells us, when a church stresses teaching the way it should, Ephesians 4.14 says, then we will no longer be infants, babies, tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Oh my gosh, think of the world that we live in right now, the society that we are a part of, the media that surrounds us. Oh my goodness. If you don't know God's word, then you don't know the truth, and you're, you, you're liable to believe everything from this cunning and crafty people in this deceitful, scheming world. So that was one reason. So we don't have false teaching. Two, if we don't grasp the importance of teaching, we can slip into worldly and pagan attitudes in our own lives. That's what happened at the church in Corinth. And Paul wrote them a letter, and he said in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, he said, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants, babies in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. You recognize the similarity of Hebrews 5 here? He goes on to say, indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? I guess that's the litmus test for whether you're worldly or not. Jealousy and quarreling. Are you not acting like mere people? Hmm. If we don't grasp the importance of teaching, if we don't spend enough time in God's word so that we know it and we can share it. The world and the attitudes of the world can slip in. The last reason I'm going to give you about the importance of seeking to grow into being able to teach is perhaps the most important. And, and this last reason goes to the very heart of why. And it is this. Christianity is the most powerful religion in the world. Christianity is the most powerful religion in the world. David wrote in Psalm 119, verse 98, Your commands, talking to God, are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. Mm -hmm. And I believe Paul had that in mind when he wrote 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. We don't do things the way the world does. We don't address politics and, 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 and society the way the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension. You know what a pretension is? A pretension is where I just kind of talk about myself. I boast about myself. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So what is this weapon that we have that can demolish strongholds and overcome arguments and wipe away that pretentiousness, that self-boasting that we have? that we're exposed to. Well, it's the sword of the Spirit, God's Word. It is so powerful that Hebrews 4.12 says it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, even to dividing joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Speaking and teaching like an adult. You know, the dedication of the early church to God's word is one of the major reasons Christianity is the most powerful religion in the world. I don't know if you realize it, but 
in the Islam religion during its first 200 years, it spread its faith by force of arms and intimidation. Over 200,000 people died as a result of Muhammad's teachings. By contrast, during the first 300 years or more of Christianity's existence, the church had no standing army, no underground terrorist group, no armed force of any kind. The only people who died as a result of the Christian faith were Christians. They were martyrs that died by stoning or beheading or crucifixion as offerings in the Colosseum of Rome. And yet, Christianity persevered to eventually conquer the entire Roman Empire. And it wasn't by the force of arms. It was by the power of God's word. The power of God's word learned and taught by thousands of faithful believers. Hebrews 5 tells us that as Christians, our goal should be to reach the point in our maturity where we all, all of us become teachers. That means we need to start training for that. That means that we need to start using whatever opportunities we can as soon as possible to do that. In closing, let me share this. It was a young guy who had heard the gospel and he accepted Christ as his savior. And a little while after that, a Christian teacher asked him, what have you done for Christ since your conversion, since you believed? And the young man replied, oh, I'm just a learner. Well, said the Christian teacher, let me ask you this, when you light a candle, do you light it to make the candle more comfortable or do you light it to give light? And the young guy says, well, to give light, of course. Well, the teacher says, do you expect it to give light after it's half burned down or when you first light it? And the young man replies, well, as soon as I light it. And the teacher says, well, very well. Go thou and do likewise and begin at once. To you, the church on the boulevard, I say very well. It is time to grow up and speak and teach like an adult. And it is time to begin now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, sometimes... It hurts, I know. I read your word and sometimes I am convicted, sometimes I feel rebuked, sometimes I feel encouraged. But most of all, Lord, whatever your word, however your word speaks to me, I want to obey it. And I pray that each one of us here this morning desire the same thing, obeying you, obeying your word. Lord. We've been talking about being grown up, about being mature, like you as a servant and now as an adult, speaking and teaching your word. Father, help us to do that. Help us to be a workmanship that is worthy. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing about being mature, being a grown-up or an adult in our relationship with Jesus is that you have to be his. You have to know whose you are, whose you belong to. Would you stand in this saying, I am thine. Oh, so
said, Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by thy power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend to friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Our benediction for today is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's workmanship. How many people profess to be a Christian, somebody who has accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord? You are God's workmanship. He has saved us, sanctified us, and equipped us for his service to fulfill his purpose and his pleasure. And it brings him pleasure when we fulfill the purpose that he's given us. Amen? Amen. Enjoy your day.